So, um, autonomous guidance for small bodies, no? Okay, so this is like a, an overview of, let's say, all the targets that have been uh, explored in proximities, all the small bodies that have been explored in, pro in proximities in the last two decades. Um, the advantages of doing proximity operation is clear if we compare the uh, quality of the, uh, the the knowledge on the on the shape, on the dynamics, and on the, the composition of these uh, bodies provided by proximity operations compared to ground-based observation is, is is clear why we need to do proximity operations. But why do we need to go for autonomous goal-oriented approach? So the thing is that we can. Uh, of course, you can just do like autonomous navigation when you're flying in proximity of a, of a small body, but it may be more uh, expensive to try to follow a predefined trajectory when you're moving uh, in the proximity of an environment that you don't know. And when you're trying to actually to achieve a mapping of this, of this environment, a, a better solution could be to update, to keep updating your, your trajectory to uh, maximize your, your objectives. So this was the state of the work when I arrived here. So the the, the methodology I've been wor working on in the uh, in the previous year was mainly uh, focused on uh, reachability analysis. It basically consists in sampling the control domain, optimizing one arc at a time to maximize a certain type of uh, observation score. Why it's what are the advantages of this? You can impose any kind of observation constraints in terms of resolution, uh, ground sampling distance, illumination, and everything. And you can actually optimize, you can ge generate an optimal path from scratch without the needing of having a reference solution. And the, the advantage is that you can actually come up with uh, trajectories that are quite uncommon, like hyperbolic covering arcs or like uh, any kind of uh, trajectory, not necessarily elliptical close trajectories around the target. Of course, it's a very expensive pro process. It's hard. And as we will see, there are some problems in tracking uncertainties when we do this. And this is optimizing only one arc at a time. So we're not doing like a global optimization in the sense that we're just optimizing the trajectory between one maneuver and the next. We propose here a change of perspective. We go from this search in the control domain for the single for the single arc to in the search in the, in the entire control profile of the trajectory, trying to simplify the definition of these observation regions, defining, for example, as, as can be seen here, by imposing the resolution and a certain declination uh, angle over the surface, it's possible to define a region defined in the asteroid fixed frames, a convex region that uh, in which we want to stay to do scientific observations. Now, without going too much into the details, the, the interesting thing here is that what we are trying to minimize is the distance of our spacecraft from these kind of observation regions. And to do that, we need to compute the projection of the spacecraft positions on these convex sets. This is by itself a convex problem. But if we do a proper change of, of variables, this convex problem is an analytical solution. And so we can actually express analytically the distance of the spacecraft position from this convex set. And this is what we try to minimize. We try to minimize a linear combination of these distances uh, of, of the trajectory from the different observation regions that we may have at given observation epochs. And we'll come back to see like how we define these observation regions. Subject to what? To the dynamics, of course, and to some uh, admissibility uh, regions. We have some constraints on the, on the available control and on the observation time. In particular, we don't want the observation to fall within the in, within an interval that is too close to a maneuver. Before the maneuver, because that's the time that is typically dedicated to onboard operations to realign the spacecraft in the trusting directions, and after the maneuver, because this gives enough time to for the navigation filter on board to converge. The control constraints is very simple. It's just maximum uh, allowed delta D uh, in every control in every control point. Okay, so the, the observation epoch, how do we define the observation epoch? The thing is that um, it's defined as the minimum distance of the trajectory from a given observation region. So the, our, our cost function is just a linear combination of the minimum distances of the trajectories from the different observation regions that we want to uh, cross. 
uh, admissible domain. We have an impact radius, we have uh, an escape radius, and we can move in between. In these applications that we are showing here, we use a constant radius, but we can generalize these using the surface radius. And in this case, our impact uh, region, our impact constraints reduces to the, the surface of the asteroid. This is a non-convex problem. We want to solve it within the framework of the SCP, of the sequential convex programming. We need to convexify it. The idea is that we start from a reference trajectory. So how do we do that? To make the, the, the cost function uh, convex, we need to, the, object, the objective function convex, we need to evaluate the observation epochs on the reference trajectory. Otherwise, we have an implicit definition of the observation epochs that uh, doesn't allow to to solve the problem in a convex framework. Then uh, the dynamics is linearized. This is a pre pre classical approach using the STM. Um, and the impact constraints is convexified, uh, approximating, approximating the constraints locally with half spaces. OK, this is an important point. So um, to, in order to compute the observation epochs, the TI star values, we need to have uh, a high definition of our trajectory, a fine time discretization of our trajectory. This means that uh, we need uh, many discretization points on the trajectory. If we used all those discretization points, for example, in the case in which we, that we will show uh, later, we will have something around uh, four, more than 4,000 degrees of freedom for our problem. What we do, so what we do to, to reduce this is just to do a domain reduction and consider only the epochs in which something is happening. So either we have a maneuver or we have an observations. And, and yeah, these are the two events that are considered. And again, in that case, we go from 4,300 degrees of freedom to 126 degrees of freedom. So we have a massive reduction in the size of the problem and of course in the uh, computational cost. Okay, the SCP framework is uh, pretty standard. So we start from a reference trajectory. We move gradually away from the trajectory until we reach the, the optimal trajectory that we want. With respect to the classical problem formulation, we have maybe two differences, two, two big differences here. The first one is that we are doing this continuous mapping from the fine discretization domain to the, to the optimization domain. And the other point is that to assess to, to modify the trust region, which is what tells me that my, my optimal trajectory needs to stay close at each iteration of the, of the SCP, you need to stay close to the reference one. The way we adjust this trust region depends on the nonlinear propagation of the trajectory that is used with the optimal control. This is slightly different usually. This is done by comparing the objective functions instead of comparing the, the, um, the actual nonlinear trajectory. So we are actually using uh, the nonlinear error to adjust the trust region. Okay, this is an important point. So, uh, how do we treat uncertainties? As I said, this was also uh, is also dealt in, in literature, even in the case uh, of uh, reachability analysis. The idea is that uh, we have a certain uncert a certain uh, um, covariance uh, at a given maneuver point, and we propagate this covariance somehow. In this case, we are just using linear covariance propagation, but this is not. Uh, uh, I mean, we, you could use different types of uh, covariance propagation to the point in which the to the point of interest. In this case, the observation uh, the observation time, and based on the on the size of the uncertainty ellipsoid, we scale down the observation regions to make to make sure that even under uncertainties we cross the observation region. But as you can say, as you can tell, there is a limitation of this because if I have a high uncertainty the observation region can shrink the point. And of course, we don't want that. So what we did is that what we did is deriving a conservative formulation based on the eigen structure, eigen structure of the uh, state transition matrix to, to define a cross form solution as a function of the delta V that is given in the control point. Why? Because the covariance in the maneuvering point is given by navigation uncertainties, of course, and by control uncertainties. In particular, in this work with control uncertainties, we mean uh, magnitude uncertainties and uh, trusting direction, uh, firing direction uh, misalignments. So the, the value of the uh, control that we give in, uh, in T0 
can be actually computed to achieve a certain desired rescaling factor of the observational region. This is the novel part from this point of view. Okay, here I'm gonna go very, very quickly because it's like a lot of equations I don't want to bother you uh, too much on this. We tried two types of state representation to, to prove this, this methodology. One is the, the one of Cartesian coordinates and another one is uh, the one with uh, a, a certain set of orbital elements. Um, okay, so the, the dynamics here, okay, it's pretty, it's pretty clear. The, the interesting thing here is that the Jacobian of the dynamics in this case can be known analytically. Um, and then using the Jacobian of the dynamics evaluated on the reference trajectory, we can uh, propagate the variational equations and compute the STM that is used in, in the dynamics. Another point is the modeling of the control in the, in the linearized version of the dynamics. So here the, the dynamics of the system is control affine, meaning that is proportional in the, con in, in the control term. And the B matrix, the control input matrix, does not depend on the, on the spacecraft state. This is exact for Cartesian coordinates. We will see that this is not the case when we introduce orbital elements. And also, when we want to express the spacecraft position, RB is in body frame, in the asteroid fixed frame, this, when we express the state in Cartesian coordinates, this is a linear function, okay, time dependent, but still a linear function of the spacecraft state. So this means that our objective function is actually naturally convex. This is just a show you what the algorithm does. So uh, this is the reference trajectory from which we start. This is a single example. This is the reference tra trajectory from which we start. The red region is the impact region. The blues, the red circles are the maneuvering point. The red points, I don't know if you can see them, the red points are the forbidden regions that are in proximity of the maneuvers. And the, the blue um, convex sets are the observation regions and the, the blue stars are the epochs at which you want to do observation. So as you can see, the initial trajectory doesn't cross all the, observa all, all the observation regions. We run the SCP. The cost function goes to convergence is less than 10 iterations. Here you can see the, the delta V for the four maneuvering points expressed in the RTN frame. And this is what it looks like to see the evolution of the trajectory in the inertial and in the target and in the asteroid fixed frame during the SCP. So as you can see, we start from a circular polar orbit. This trajectory is banded. In particular, in this case, we are considering only the effect of J2. So you can see that the algorithm tries to change the inclination of the orbit such that the um, drift of the right ascension of the ascending node helps in matching all the features, in, in crossing all the observation regions, sorry. And this is what happens actually in the, in the asteroid phase frame. So you see that the, the, the observation regions are red when the trajectory is not crossing them and it becomes green after nine, 10 iterations. Okay, at this, uh, I, will, I will skip it. We performed some kind of uh, robustness analysis on this. We ran a Monte Carlo analysis by picking 5,000 points, 5,000 features on the, on the surface of Eros. And we ran 500 cases, having 10 different observation regions, 10 different features that we want to map for every case. The metric that we use to assess the performance of the of the of the algorithm is this kind of average distance. So, given a trajectory and a set of observation regions, we have a single value of this average distance. And what you can see here is is quite interesting. So, basically, here you have on the x-axis the initial average distance, the initial mean distance from of the trajectory from the set of observation regions, and on the y-axis you have the final one. As you can see, we are always below this, which is I mean, luckily we are always below this, which means that the algorithm doesn't um, degrade the performance of the, of the original trajectory, which is the very least that we could achieve. And, uh, uh, but what you can see is that there is a trend in, the, in performances in which the farther we are from the, uh, from the optimal solution, from the, the, the set of observation regions, the lower, uh, the, the higher, sorry, the final distance is. So, this underlined the importance of starting from a guess solutions that is relatively close, close to, the, to, the optimal, to the optimal one. A very interesting plot is this one on the trust region. The trust region tells you basically how the SCP is converging. So what we see here is that on average, the trust region increases over the iterations, which means that the algorithm is actually converging to an optimal solution and, not, and is not being constrained by a very small observation regions. So we are actually approaching an optimal value. 
Second formulation, ROEs. Um, the idea here is that the reference trajectory is seen as the chief trajectory, and the optimal trajectory of the algorithm is seen as the deputy trajectory. With respect to the previous case, we have a dynamics that is much more nonlinear in the sense that um, it's it's difficult, no, not nonlinear, nonlinear is not the right term. We, we have a dynamics that uh, it's hard to express analytically in terms, directly in terms of R ROEs. Uh, in particular, we are using here the GVs in the quasi non-singular form to integrate the, the dynamics of the, of the orbital elements and the dynamics of the relative orbital elements is a function of, of this. So what we do here is to compute numerically this Jacobian using central finite differences. And then we compute the STM, integrate, integrate the variational equations, and then we propagate the dynamics. But this time, the control input matrix, which is a function of the, of the spacecraft state, the fact that we can write the dynamics linearly in the control with a control affine model is an approximation. It's in fact an approximation of, of what is actually happening. An example of this is seen by the fact that if we have a normal maneuver, we are not changing with this model the semi-major axis of the orbit. While and this is quite accurate assumptions. If it's a quite accurate assumption, if we are uh, uh, working with the very small maneuvers, but if the delta v is large, this doesn't hold anymore. If I have a delta v maneuver, not only I change the inclination of the orbit, but I also change the energy that is uh, embedded by by the orbit. So I also change the semi-major axis. Finally, we need to linearize the cost function this time, because this time the, the, we don't have a linear uh, expression of the radius in, in asteroid fixed frame as a function of the, of the spacecraft state, because we, this would be like uh, a trigonometric function of the spacecraft state. So we actually need to do uh, one more linearization here, passing from the RTN space to uh, linearize the, the, to make the, the objective function convex. This is, the same case shown before, but with ROEs. Here you can see the distances of the different closest point to their corresponding observational regions. You can see that the algorithm is still improving performances, but not as much as before. Okay, this is the evolution of the orbital elements. We can come back on this later. We won't have time to do that now. This is the representation in the RTN space. The important thing about this slide, and again, we can come back on this later if, you, if you're interested in, the important thing of this slide is that this shows here that we have um, that the mapping, the linear mapping is actually accurate. So the, 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 when I say the linear mapping, I mean the linear approximation of the objective function is actually accurate. The error comes from the nonlinearity that appears when we apply large controls to the system. Delta Vs, um, Cartesian approach uh, tends to have maneuvers which have uh, components that are pretty spreaded. In particular, we have uh, significant normal components to the trajectories, while with the ROE's approach, what we, we observed is that we have many more in-play maneuvers than normal maneuvers. Now, it's important to say here that we are not minimizing Delta V here. We are just, in our objective function, we are just minimizing uh, the observation score of the trajectory. Typically, when we are moving in proximity of small bodies, minimizing delta v is not necessarily the priority because you have a high connectivity of the configuration space, so you can move easily from one point to the other with the limited cost. But potentially, we could include the, the include the cost of the maneuver in the in the optimization. This is what happens when we look at the observation at the at the trust region. So in this case, okay, this is rescaled to take into account for the different dimensionality of the problem. But uh, the important thing here is that we can start from a trust region that is larger than the one of Cartesian coordinates, because and this is due to the fact that uh, that uh, the dynamics of the ROEs is, is way lower than the one of Cartesian coordinates. So we can actually have an initial guess which converge to a, to a good solution that is. Uh, from uh, with a trust region that is much larger, one order of magnitude larger than the one that we have here. But then what happens is that uh, as long as we proceed on the iterations of the SCP, the control input increases. 
So the non-linear error due to the fact that we are approximating the dynamics with the linear control increases, and therefore the trust region shrinks. And as a consequence, the problem is not reaching optimality as it was doing in Cartesian coordinates, but it's basically being constrained by the, the shrinking of the, of the trust region. And in fact, this is what happens when you look at the same metric that we used before. So you see, so black dots here are the one used with the arrows. Sorry, I missed the legend here. And blue dots are the one I just, I just, you, that we obtain using Cartesian coordinates. We can see that uh, the the slope of the performance that we can get with arrow is is larger. So this is basically the work that will be well, apart from the comparison, this will be the work that will be presented at SciTech in January. I just wanted to give a very quick uh, overview of possible next step and applications on this. Now we took into account uh, navigation and control uncertainties. We are still missing two dynamics and target uncertainties. The way we plan to do that, to take to include these two effects, is to frame this algorithm within an MPC framework, within a model predictive control framework. You could also take dynamics and uncertainty into account by modeling them as process noise. It's true. We still have to do a trade-off on this, but for sure we'll have to implement this within an MPC framework in any case for uh, feasibility demonstration. So this will be for sure one of the next steps. Um, it would be interesting to combine the reachability analysis approach with this SCP approach, because at that point we could generate a rough estimate of the optimal trajectory from scratch using the, the reachability analysis approach, and then we refine that optimal solution using the SCP. And finally, hardware in the loop. Hardware in the loop, when I say hardware in the loop, I mean either processor in the loop, which allows to demonstrate the feasibility of implementation of the algorithm, and also camera in the loop if, if some, time of, some types of application is, is investigated. So if we go to applications, what we can do with this, because this is a very nice demonstration, but like what, what can we achieve with this, with this kind of, uh, of methods? So one idea, and it's the one that I will try to work on, let's say from now to the end of December, is to try to couple this with the snack approach, or at least with the feature tracking part of the snack approach. So the idea is basically to, to see how we can use the information that comes from the navigation to construct an observation model and update the trajectory to improve the observation that we did of the target that we want to, and the feature tracking, for example, that we want to, to achieve and the shape reconstruction of the body. Another interesting application could be like the motion within the brilliant sphere of the target. This is a region in which the classical modeling of uh, gravitational field doesn't work. So we cannot use like polyhedral, um, polyhedron or uh, spherical harmonics to describe the gravity field. So there, there is some interesting work in which analytical solutions are found. It, and I mean, I don't know if Professor D'Amico remembers, but these kind of shapes is really similar to the one that we were getting at the beginning when we were trying to use the SCP. So it would be actually very nice to try to see if there is the possibility of finding this analytical solution with our, with our approach. And another application for which this methodology fits really well, in my opinion, is, is flybys. So think about, for example, uh, the case in which we are doing a flyby of, of, uh, of an asteroid and we want to observe a specific area of the surface. What we can have is we have an initial flyby trajectory and we want to adjust that trajectory to observe that specific feature based on the observation that we have of the target while we are approaching. So for example, we could estimate the rotational state of the target while we are approaching, and then we would know where the feature would be, and we could adjust this, this the trajectory to, to, to achieve this kind of objective. Okay, so this is just this is what I said before on the on the possible application on the stack. And I'm gonna stop here. There were some other slides on the other in the loop part, but I will uh, keep them for another time probably because we are definitely out of time. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer.